each and every day we get upon this earth is soaked with meaning and purpose. The challenge is we get so used to the routine, so lulled by the mundane, our days start to blend together and fade with familiarity. If we're not careful, we can look back and realize we've wasted what we've been given. But if we could begin to understand the brevity of this life, the eternal implications of how we live now, we can start to live our lives with deeper purpose and urgency. Each day becomes a possibility for purpose. Each moment becomes an opportunity for meaning. The book of James calls us to live out this brief moment we've been given upon this earth with wisdom, with urgency, with significance. It beckons you, don't waste your life. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue on in our series through the book of James. And James is a book of wisdom so that we can make the most of our lives. And what we're going to be talking about today um, is the power of life-transforming words. Now, I was in fourth grade when I first learned how powerful words could be. Um, I had learned a cuss word and decided to say it in class. Um, it didn't start with the letter A, B, C, D, E. It didn't start with G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, or Z. Um, little mullet-wearing, 85-pound, fourth-grade Jason said the F word. Yeah, thank you. That was a better reaction. The 930 shamed me for it. <laughs> so like, whoa. I was like, gee. All right. And uh, Julie Lau heard me. And Julie Lau decided it was the right thing to do uh, to tell my fourth grade teacher. And my fourth grade teacher uh, wrote a referral for me and s sent me to the office the first time that had ever happened. And while I'm headed to the office, I was hoping more than anything uh, that it would be the principal I would have to see and not the vice principal. Now, normally you think it's the opposite, right? You're like, no, just the vice principal. Um, I ended up seeing the vice principal, and here's why this was an issue. Uh, the vice principal was also my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> yeah, and so I sat in Sammy D'Amico's office as he read over my referral, and he looked at me, and he just said, you know, Jason, there's only one word that comes to mind, disappointed. <laughs> and like, my, like I was weeping, drying my tears with my mullet. I was just a, I was, I was a basket case. And, uh, and then Sammy D'Amico had the nerve to uh, tell my parents. Oh, man, I was nervous. I, going home, I was basically planning my funeral, like, oh, when my parents find out. But here's what's interesting to me. My parents had a really unique approach to it. They sat down and uh, they shared what my consequence was gonna be and it was way less than what I thought it was gonna be. And they said, listen, we, we don't want you talking like that, but there's way worse things that you could say. And I'm like, there's worse words than that, right? You know? And they said, yeah, you could say words that are untrue and you could break our trust with you by deceiving us. You could say words that are hurtful to other people and not just breaking our trust, but breaking other people down. And those are way worse. And I think my parents were spot on. And I think the weight of our words, we need to understand. This is what, what James is getting at here in chapter three. He wants us to understand how powerful our words can be. They hold the power of life and death in them. And I want to look at the power of life-transforming words. So let's look at James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. This is talking about teaching or preaching in the church. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Here's the first thing we have to understand. We are responsible for our words. We have to actually give an account for the things that we say and the impact that it has on others. The decisions we make, oh, there, there's a weight to it, especially those who teach in the church. There, there's a weight 
to standing up and proclaiming the truths of God and teaching the word of God. I had somebody come up to me one time and he was arguing with me that he should be able to be preaching in our church. And I was like, man, you don't even believe in Jesus, right? And he was like, yeah, but you guys need multiple perspectives. And I'm like, this is, you don't get what we're doing here, right? We exist to preach the gospel. This is what, where we're at. And so there's a weight to it. There, there needs to be a weight to it. And so my commitment, week in and week out, is to preach God's word as God's word is presented. Not what culture wants us to think or not what criti- critics want us to do, but to present the word of God as holy and good and righteous. And, and my ask of you is that you would be committed to praying for me and my family and the other teachers and the leaders of this church as we seek to faithfully bring God's word and, and, and participate and lead in a church in a way that we have to give an account for. But, but also in this passage, I want us to understand that all of us are responsible for our words. It's not just teachers who will stand judgment over what is said and done. It's all of us. We have to give an account for the way we've affected and influenced others. We've shaped and formed them. In fact, Jesus is even more explicit about this in Matthew 12. He says, everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Now, we expect that Jesus and James would call out and condemn profane or vile uses of the tongue, but careless? Really? It's because in careless words, we can absolutely destroy and damage people. We can shape how they view and understand themselves and what it looks like. We can be harmful and hurtful. We can lead people astray. We can even be hypocritical by being careless with our tongue. And so we too quickly assume that the sins of the tongue are a small thing. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. You have to give an account. We are responsible for our words. James continues, verse 3, he says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes a great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. First observation, James is such a brilliant writer, is he not? You can just picture these things, can you not? You picture this massive ship moving along the sea, yet it's a small little rudder that steers where it will go. We can picture the forest around us. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we experience this every August and September as we see the damage done by a small spark that sets a forest ablaze. And what James is saying, he's like, that's the tongue. He's saying our words have power. And we need to understand that one of the most powerful, influential tools we have is our words. So I want to give you a theology of words to understand scripturally how we see the impact, biblically the power, how words have the power to create and shape and make. And because we are created in God's image, he has given our words power as well. See, words, they carry immeasurable significance. Uh, The universe was created with a word. You realize that, that God spoke the universe The stars, light and dark, he spoke it into existence. God forms his creation's identity through names. He uses words to form our identity. When Satan slithers onto the scene as a crafty serpent, what's his tool for deception? It's his words. And what does he question? He questions the words of God. Did God really say? There's weight and there's power. Jesus, not only was he the word take on flesh and blood, but when he shows up, he heals and casts out demons by his words. He heals people with words, and he casts out evil spirits with his words. He calmed the raging sea. How? 
They came to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, don't you care that we die? And he stood up, and with his words, he said, be still. And the storm around them that was raging was still. Rulers have risen and fallen by their words. God is worshipped through our words. That's how we glorify God. For generations, we have worshipped God. I, I got to tell you, one of the greatest joys is every Sunday when I'm getting ready to preach, I'm behind this wall, I'm getting ready to come up. And because I'm behind that wall and I'm behind the speakers, I don't hear the worship team. You know what I hear? I hear the church worshiping. It, you worship and it bounces off that wall back to me. And it is a jo joy listening to this church worship and glorify God in one voice. It is with our words, whether it be worship and praise, whether it be confession, whether it be preaching the gospel, that we worship God. And yet also Jesus, it tells us in Hebrews 1.3, he continually sustains and upholds the universe by his words. Because words are powerful. They have all kinds of power in life. Uh, first, they have the power to encourage. This is what Proverbs says. It says, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. You, in, in how you speak to someone, you have the power to build them up or to tear them down. I'll never forget, I was watching this uh, old interview with Mariah Carey, who at the time, she was at, just at the top of the top. She had sold more records than everybody except Elvis and the Beatles at the time. And, and they were interviewing her, and she was talking about how she can hear a thousand praises in just one criticism, and that one criticism weighs way more than those thousand praises that she hears. It just sticks with her. We have to understand there, there is power in our words, and how are we using it? How are we wielding this power? Is it to encourage and spur one another on to, want, to love and good deeds? to call them into something. Man, I remember being 15 years old, and I had three men within a course of three months that spoke encouragement into my life that completely shaped me. Like, I was a punk of a kid at 15 years old. You saw me as a fourth grader. Imagine that trajectory played out a little bit, right? I was just I was a punk of a kid. And, and, and I, God started to get a hold of my life and started to call me to follow him. And I started, as, at 15, I started to follow him in any way that I could. I remember this conversation I had a guy with, with Brian Campbell. I'm walking past him into the lobby. And our youth group, we had student-led small groups. We would gather together as a large youth group, and then we'd break up into small groups, and students would lead it. And at 15 years old, he's, he's walking past me, and he looks at me, and he goes, hey, man, you're going to lead a small group this year, right? And I looked around because I was trying to figure out who he was talking to. I was like, you, you're picking out the wrong dude. Like, I'm the guy nobody likes. Like, I'm the punk kid. And he, and he looks at me and he goes, no, God's got a call in your life, man. You should do it. And they just walked away. Small moment. I remember this 22 years later, I remember that conversation. I remember where it was. I remember what the carpet looked like. That was a shaping moment. That is the power that words have. They have the power to encourage. They have the power to shape identities. This is what Proverbs 18 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. There's power to shape identities. You have no idea how you can speak into someone's identity, what they feel like, how they understand and view themselves. Uh, listen, when somebody walks through the, the doors of this church, you, it is such a hard thing to do if you're not connected to a church. You have no idea what, what you're walking into, what it's going to be like, what, what, how you're going to be treated. Do you have any idea how powerful it is when you look someone in the eyes and say, welcome, you belong here. I want you to be a part of this church. I want, I want you to be a part of this community. You ever watch the documentary um, on Mr. Rogers? Man, that guy was amazing. All throughout it, over and over, you know what he says to kids over and over? He looks at them in the eye and he says, I like you just the way you are. I like you just the way you are. In a world that is telling us to become something else, to look like her or to make money like him or to dress like that person, over and over, Fred Rogers would just look at these kids and say, I like you just the way you are. And you could just see them light up as he's calling out their God-given identity. No, you were created in God's image on purpose for a purpose. I want you to know both who you are and whose you are. The way we could speak into people's life 
in that way. It, we have power. It, for me, in my identity, in my calling life, it, there's just been so many moments, and I, and I think about other pastors I'm connected with. We can, so many of us can speak look back to a moment where somebody spoke into our identity, spoke into our calling in a powerful way. Uh, before planting Rise, I was a youth pastor at a church, and, and m- my wife, Jessie, she was pregnant with Dax, getting ready to have him, and, and we were leaving this church trying to seek the Lord on what was next. And it's challenging when you leave, leave a church. People don't like it. People feel hurt. People feel frustrated. People feel all kinds of reasons to, to be upset with you. And so I'm stopping by the church for the last time to get the last few things out of my office. And this guy named Jesse Calvert is driving a lawnmower mowing the lawn. He just became a deacon at the church, right? And he looks over, and he kind of waves me over. I'm like, oh, great. Like, what's, what's he going to say? And I walk up to him, and he, and, he, and he turns the lawnmower off, and he goes, hey, I, I feel like God is telling me I need to say this to you. Um, I think you should plant a church. And I was like, what, why would you share that? Like, what, what made you feel the need? He's like, because I think that's God's call in your life, and I think our city could really use it. And he starts the lawnmower back up, and he drives off and sprays me with grass, right? You know? <laughs> that was a moment for me. A years later, I ran into him at a park, and I was like, hey, do you, one time we had a, he's like, I remember. He, before I even brought it up, he knew. He's like, yeah, I just felt the Holy Spirit in that moment. I, I've had so, my, my brother-in-law was wrestling with uh, feeling called into ministry. And somebody looked at him and said, hey, if you don't feel called, you don't do this. And so he's sitting in a Starbucks and, and he's just wrestling over this idea and he's like, God, do you even want me? Are, are you really calling me? To, because like, I, I don't feel equipped, I don't feel ready, like I just, I need some clarity. And a woman walks up to him in this Starbucks. She's holding a latte and she's nervous, she's shaking. She's like, I am really sorry, this is really weird but I feel like God has told me to tell you that you are wanted and called and turned around and walked off and left. And he was like, wow. I had another friend who was thinking about taking a pastoral job up in Wenatchee, Washington. And he was living in Los Angeles at the time and he just interviewed for it, had discussion, they offered it to him, but he, he felt ill-equipped. He felt, felt not ready. He, he didn't know if ministry is what he wanted to do with his life. And he's driving down the I-5 corridor and he's, he's asking God for clarity. God, give me clarity. God, give me clarity. And he, all he could think is, I'm hungry. That's, that's it. So he's like, well, then I'm going to pull. He pulls over in Redding, pulls up to Chipotle. And as he pulls up, a guy walks out, walks up to his window, knocks on the door, and he says, hey, um, God told me to meet you here and to do two things. One, to tell you uh, to take the job, and two, here's a burrito, <laughs> right? <laughs> He told me that story. I'm like, all I got was grass clippings and you got a Chipotle burrito. Are you kidding me? (laughs) But here's what I want you to see, okay? Again, this is my world, but you have your calling. And the people around you have their calling. You have no idea how you can affirm what God is trying to speak to them by being a word of encouragement in their life. There is power. There is death and life are the power of the tongue. That's the Bible, a scripture that is telling us that there's power to actually bring healing into the wounds that people have faced. Proverbs 16, 24 puts it like this, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. When you're sitting on the other side of a conversation, you don't know what they've been through that week. You don't know how their parents just spoke to them, their roommate, their spouse, their kids, their boss. You don't know the kind of voices that are rattling in their head from when they were a little kid, from a coach or a teacher. And yet, with your words, your words could be like honeycomb. They could be sweet to the soul and healing to the body. This is why Ann Voskamp, she put it like this. She says, only speak words that make souls stronger. For once words are spoken, they may be forgiven, but may be not forgotten. There's power in these words. And so you have no idea how one conversation, one word of encouragement, one expression of love might change someone's life and their trajectory. This is the power of words. And sometimes words, they have the power to keep someone going in a really hard season. You know, when COVID hit, um, it was hard for everybody. 
Nobody knew what to do or what's next or what this looks like in my work and job. Um, but but I'll, I'll say this. It, it was a uniquely challenging season for pastors. Uh, you're trying to lead a church, trying to figure out what is best, trying to figure out how to even balance all the differing opinions. I mean, nobody had differing opinions, but you know, I'm, you can imagine <laughs> that people had differing opinions in that season. And, and, and how do you navigate that? What, it, what does it look like? And then you're you miss your people. You don't, you're not seeing them on a regular basis. You're not having these interactions. Like Part of the greatest joy, I, I love Sundays. I love being with our church and, and catching up and, and seeing my people. And so we're going through this season of like, what do we do next and how do we navigate it? And, and I remember uh, late April, early May, I went out to the mailbox and I got a postcard, just one. And uh, on the front... It just had a verse, 1 Timothy 5, 17. Those elders who lead well deserve double honor, especially those who toil in the word and in teaching. And I flipped around, and it was from a couple I knew, and I thought, man, that's, that's an encouraging postcard. And this was a cool design. I wonder where they got that. And then the next day, I went out to the post office. It went to our mailbox, and there was more. And the next day, and the next day, and for the next weeks and months, day after day after day, my mailbox was just filled, jam-packed with words of encouragement, words affirming my calling. Words like, I, I have no doubt Jesus has you leading this church in this city for a huge gospel movement that God has planned. Love you, brother. Do you know, do you know what kind of impact words like that have on somebody who's questioning their identity and calling in a moment like that, who's questioning what it looks like to lead. Words are powerful, you guys. And what James is saying is, is no, we have, we can shape, we can bring life, we can heal through our words if we would understand the power of what and the impact that they make. Verse seven, he says, all kinds of animals Birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What James is saying is that our words are, are an overflow. Our, what's coming out of our mouth is an overflow of what's in our heart. And James, he's not just trying to give us behavior. He's saying, no, no, our lives should be transformed by Jesus and the way that we speak and the way that we talk should be a reflection of him, right? That we should be life-giving in the way we build others up and defend them and speak grace and love and truth into their life. Uh, a couple months ago, a group of us went, flew to Atlanta for a conference, okay? And so uh, Kristen, friend, she was coming from Dallas. All the rest of us were coming from Portland. And so she got there before we did. And so she picked up the van we had rented, and she went to the Airbnb to check it out. We were arriving late. We were going to arrive at 1 o'clock in the morning. And so we were going to be exhausted, get in the van, go to the Airbnb and rest. And so she goes to the Airbnb, makes sure everything's set up. She walks in, and it was a complete disaster. <laughs> like dead cockroaches oh, no. everywhere hair in the beds, like grimy. It was like smelled of urine. She, she said she, she gagged as she walked in the room, right? And so she's like, we cannot stay here. Like, but they're, you know, they're flying. The whole, all the rest of our group is flying through there. I need to figure out a solution uh, by the time they land. And so she gets on the phone, calls Airbnb, explains what happens. And they say, oh, we are so sorry. We'll help you get booked in a different place. But, but the only, ch the, the problem is, uh, you're Kristen, and this is booked under Jason's name, and so I just need to speak with him real quick and confirm all this stuff, and we get it. Well, she's sitting there, and she's like, but he's in the air. I can't, like, we need to solve this now. I'm not going to wait till one in the morning. So she goes, okay, hold, hang on one second. Let me get him, right? Puts it on hold. 
This is Jason. <laughs> and the lady on the phone goes, ma'am, that's not him. <laughs> and she just sits there, not knowing what to do or say, and so she just hangs up, right? That is Chris. She's a problem solver, is she not, right? <laughs> Ma'am, that's not him. <laughs> Here's the thing. I wonder how often God looks down upon us expecting to see his son, expecting the words that we use to be full of grace and truth and life like his son. And he looks at us and he says, that's not him. This is what James is saying right here, that there should be an overflow, that we sh how can we talk out both sides of our mouth? How can we be people who show up on Sunday and praise God and then curse his creation with the same mouth? How can we glorify God and gossip about our brothers and sisters with the same lips? How can we sing worship and spread slander with the same tongue? And James is telling us we should recognize if that's what's pouring out of us, then there's something wrong in, within us. There is something off because it's from the heart that the mouth pours forth. And so what's pouring forth from our mouths? Is it truth and gentleness? Is it patience and love? Or is it harshness and gossip and anger? There's a reason we hurt others. And I think Brene Brown, she hits it on the head right here. This is what she says. She says, after studying vulnerability, shame, and authenticity for the past decade, here's what I've learned. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, and we hurt others. If there is a harshness spilling forth, I can tell you why. It's because you have a wound that has not been healed with. We shame others because we feel ashamed. We hurt others because we've been hurt. We accuse and we tear down others with our words. We gossip and slander instead of actually speaking to them. We nurse and enforce and broadcast our grudges instead of forgiving as Christ has forgiven us. It's a glimpse that we are dealing with shame and hurt ourselves. You've been hurt, guilt, shame, insult, belittle. And what you need is not to fix your words. What you need is a healing on the inside. And so we read a passage like this, and it's very tempting to say, man, I feel convicted about how I've spoken to the people around me. And I think that's a good conviction. Um, but the solution is not to try harder to tame the tongue. In fact, what's fascinating about this, what, what James is saying here, is he's going through and he says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures have been tamed. Like, like we've tamed birds. Birds fly, yet we've tamed them, right? Sea creatures, like they live in our living rooms and our kids' bedrooms. Like we've tamed them. All these things we've tamed, yet guess what? No human being can tame the tongue. And so he's not saying, hey, try harder. Here's some guilt to throw on you. Would you just be nicer with your words? The solution is not trying harder to tame the tongue. The solution is to heal the heart. And what we need is we need healing from Jesus. This is why we need the gospel. Because the gospel says it's not about doing more, trying harder, being better. The gospel says we're all broken and we're all in need of healing. And so if this is resonating with you deeply today, and you're like, man, I, this is not how I use my tongue. This is not how I use my words. Can I just encourage you? Man, would, would the voice of Jesus become precious to you? 
Would you long for his words to speak into your soul. Author Brendan Manning put it like this. He says, only reckless confidence in a source greater than ourselves can empower us to forgive the wounds inflicted by others. Amen. That's what we need. We need healing from Christ. We, what is that source? You guys, that source is the voice of Jesus. This is the only way we can be trees that bear the fruit of Christ. This is only, the only way we can be springs that bear forth fresh water to others is if we ourselves are experiencing day in and day out the voice, the healing, the grace, the redemption of Christ. And so how I want to end today is not a call to do more, <laughs> tame your tongue and try harder. I just want all of us to have the words of Christ washed over us. And here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna read some scripture about who we are in Christ, what the Bible says our identity in Jesus is. And I just want you to listen to it. You can keep your eyes open and read it on the screen. You can close your eyes and just listen to it. And then I'm gonna close in prayer and then Stacy and the worship team are gonna come up and, and they're gonna lead us in a song that I'm not asking you to sing along to. I'm asking that it would minister to your soul. And so maybe you will just sit down Maybe you'll stand in worship. But I want it just to wash over you. This is what scripture tells us. Uh, Ephesians reminds us that, that we are alive in Christ. Colossians tells us that we are complete in him. Romans lets us know that we are free from the law of sin and death. Isaiah reminds us that f we are far from oppression and fear does not Come near to me. John tells us that we are born of God and the evil one does not touch me. Ephesians and Peter tells us that we are holy. First Corinthians tell us, tells us that we have the mind of Christ. Philippians tells us that we have peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And John, he tells us that we have the greater one living in us if we are in Jesus. Mark tells us that we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians tells us that, that we have no lack because God supplies and we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Peter tells us that we're God's child. Ephesians tells us that we're his workmanship. Romans speaks to us that we are more the conquerors through Christ who loves me. And Matthew tells us that we are the light of the world. Paul, in his letter to Ephesus, tells us that we are forgiven in Christ. Later in his letter to Colossians, tells us that we are delivered from the power of darkness. Peter reminds us that we are healed in Jesus, our deepest wounds. In Colossians, we are told that we are greatly loved by God. And in Galatians, we are reminded that it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus, would we receive these words? these powerful, life-transforming words. Words have the power to speak life and death, and Lord, you have spoken life over us. And so would we receive today, for those of us in this room who are dealing with some wounds and some hurts and some pain, and it is coming out in fits of anger and rage and harshness, would it not be something we just tried to control? No one can control, no one can tame the tongue, but you can heal the heart. And if you would heal our hearts and heal our souls, then what will start to bear forth and come out of our mouths and our lips is your grace and your truth and your healing and your kindness and your goodness. Lord, would we be a church that experiences your radical healing so that we can be salt and light and grace and truth and kind and gentle in a way that points people to their identity that speaks life and calling into their lives and draws them into your goodness and grace. We pray all this in your son's name.